I'm Hannah Feigl Turtle Tattle, and you are watching Taped with Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I wanna watch Monday Night Football! Forget about Monday Night Football! There's no other thing we're gonna watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug! Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. It is once again during this period of the pandemic that I have to share of the loss of one of our former guests, uh, someone very special. Uh, she was the premier uh, scholar of the Yiddish language here in the Chicago area and possibly in the world. Um, she was an expert in Yiddish theater, Yiddish literature, the Yiddish language, and uh, has translated so many things. Um, Dr. Anita Turtletaub, Allah Shalom, Dr. Hannah Fagel Turtletaub, as she was known, and uh, she's a really wonderful person that we have lost. I want to extend my condolences to her children, Jeremy Abraham, Joshua Abraham, Jessica Abraham, and Jonathan Abraham, as well as their sister, Toby Ehrlich uh, Jelen, and their entire families uh, on this great loss. Uh, her mentor, Dr. Nathaniel Stamfer, Zecher Livracha, who passed away a few years ago, um, was really uh, considered to be that great scholar. And then in his passing, it was Dr. Anita Turtletaub who took on that role. And uh, we are going to truly miss her involvement in Yiddish language and Yiddish theater. As a matter of fact, her family has asked that in her memory that the Yiddish language be kept alive, that people do things to keep the Yiddish language alive. Um, that's what they want in memory of their mother and sister. So we memorialize her and remember her as she was a guest on our show here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Dr. Hannah Fagel Turtletaub, Aleha Shalom. Dr. Anita Turtletaub, we remember her for a blessing and uh, please uh, enjoy this episode when she was with us here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. We are here in Chicago, Illinois. I'm here with Dr. Hanna Feigl Turtletaub. That's it. And uh, yes, and I've known her for most of her life as Anita. Um, and uh, she and I have been friends really since the 80s when the two of us were on a singles kosher cruise together for Pesach. Uh, and we've stayed friends ever since. But she's an amazing woman, and that's why I wanted to have her on the show. First of all, she may not say this, but I will tell all of you, she is one of maybe a couple or the most uh, prominent uh, Yiddish scholar in the Chicago area, and uh, not only a scholar in knowing Yiddish, but being able to translate and uh, decipher Yiddish that hasn't been used for generations. Uh, she's a writer, lecturer, um, teacher. Her articles on Yiddish language, Judaism, and relationships has appeared in many national and local magazines and newspapers. She's had five uh, uh, short stories published in Yiddish, one which was a feature story. Um, Dr. Uh, Turtletown has also run successful nationwide singles weekends um, all over the country, including here in Chicago. Um, she's been on the faculty of the Don Schumann Institute, the Hebrew Theological College, Oakton College, Truman College, Northwestern, Northwestern University, Harold Washington College, Spurtis College of Judaica, um, Spurtis University, and uh, she has lectured in many synagogues and Jewish organizations over the years. Uh, she's appeared on uh, Friends, she's appeared on the Milt Rosenberg radio show, and now she's appearing on Taped with Rabbi Doug. She's the co-author of a musical comedy, Love and the Cat Skills. Uh, she has uh, some incredible books, Yiddish Songs for Children, which she has published, which also comes with a, a CD inside, and these have been performed by the, which Philharmonic? The Israel, the Israel, members of the Israel, members of Israel Philharmonic have performed this. 
She has an incredible book that she has translated, which is the stories of Hans Christian Andersen. And um, she's edited and translated it completely into Yiddish. It is just an amazing thing, uh, this famous uh, work, um, which she has done and she's well known for. Um, she's really uh, someone who, if you are Jewish, you'd want to know. If you have any interest in Yiddish or European history, you'd want to know. And certainly, if you're a viewer of Tames with Rabbi Doug, you want to know um, uh, Dr. Turgeltaub. Um, I, I have here a copy of one of your articles that you've written. This is in the Jewish Forum. This is the most prominent Yiddish newspaper still in existence today in the United States and the Forward. And it's not just in the United States, it's also in Israel and other places where it is distributed. But she writes regularly an article in Yiddish. And uh, this one is uh, the matchmaker is looking for a match also. So this is, uh, uh, she, she is uh, single at the moment. And uh, if you're a fine match, and uh, uh, you'll to drop us an email at info at and I'll make an introduction. Welcome to the show. Oh, so nice to be here. You know, um, here, uh, your, your sister and brother-in-law were members of my congregation for many years uh, as well, so I know a lot of your family members. I'm, I'm so intrigued by how your family, including your sister, are, are so prominently uh, comfortable speaking Yiddish. And it's really an, an amazing thing. And you just be gone, gone beyond speaking Yiddish to translating Yiddish to doing things in Yiddish that other people haven't done. Of course, the other person who I consider to be the other Yiddish scholar in Chicago is Rabbi Dr. Stanfer, who lives in the um, uh, self-help self home in Chicago. Um, and uh, he's, he's uh, up in his years. But uh, he was, he was you know, my teacher and, and, and an incredible Yiddish scholar. And I always considered you two to be equal in that way. Um, tell me, how did you get not only your love for Yiddish, I know, did you learn Yiddish as a first language? Were you, did you grow up in a home where your mother and father spoke Yiddish to you as a baby and, and, and grew up with Yiddish before you spoke English? Actually, I did speak Yiddish before I spoke English because my parents spoke Yiddish to me. Were they born in Europe, your parents? Yes. They were. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was born in Europe. You were born in Europe well. also. Yeah. So where were you born? In, in Kazakhstan, in uh, Russia. Uh -huh. And I came as like a, a very tiny infant, you know. Um, and my love for Yiddish grew because every people heard us speak Yiddish. And they wondered why a young person was speaking Yiddish. Well, it was the only language my parents understood for a very long time. And I wound up getting a great education and a doctorate in 18th century aesthetics, the interconnection of poetry and art in the early uh, 18th century London. And after I got my doctorate and started teaching English, I quickly became bored with that and found my fascination for Yiddish growing, even academically. And I started writing Yiddish and uh, lecturing in Yiddish, and that overtook any English uh, background that I had. How did you learn your proficiency in grammar and Yiddish and all those things that a writer has to learn when you really didn't go to school for Yiddish to learn it, you learned it at home growing up? How did you, you, know, how did you study and learn these things that you had to learn to become so proficient? Well, I was teaching English at Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, and I got a sabbatical after teaching there for seven years. I went to New York and enrolled in Columbia University's language school, and there I met the Yiddishists that were prominent at the time and learned the grammar. But once you know one language, the second language comes much more easily, and uh, I started teaching classes. And if I didn't know something, I would say, well, that's a wonderful question, but that's a few chapters away. And I would scurry home and learn it. <laughs> very good, very good. So I, I just want to talk about Yiddish here in Chicago with my growing up. Now, in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the early 70s, there were Yiddish schools here in the Chicago area. People didn't necessarily go to Hebrew school. A lot of people went to Yiddish school, especially the girls, especially the girls. And um, uh, this was their Jewish education and their Yiddish education. But those schools slowly closed down uh, until the last one sold their building to the Chicago community, Kolel. And uh, 
uh, and that was it for Yiddish schools in Chicago. And really, the only Yiddish learning that continued to go on in Chicago and maybe around the country are the Hasidic day schools that taught in Yiddish and still do today. And those children learn Yiddish uh, in school from the time that they're young. But the question is, will it carry on to the next generation? So tell me it's your It's not really even carrying on that. through this generation. The only Yiddish-speaking instruction is in the Weizner Cheder. Mm -hmm. Even Cheder Lubavitch no longer teaches Yiddish as the language of instruction. They have a Yiddish class, and that's because the parents of the children going to Cheder Lubavitch don't speak Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And for a while, they thought of having me teach classes to the parents, but parents with several children, five, six children, are busy enough, uh -huh. and uh, that didn't work out. And even the teachers now at Cheder Lubavitch don't speak uh, Yiddish well enough, so that kind of fell by the wayside, and the young people are not speaking Yiddish. But with my book, I, um, I know people love, love it, it's a wonderful gift, uh -huh. and children learn Yiddish kind of while they're dancing around, it goes sure. through their head. And, one and you wrote all the music in that book wrote, by yourself. I wrote the music as well, uh -huh. even though I wasn't musical at the time, I had an innate sense of music, but I had four children under, under three. <laughs> and. That was so hard, and I used to have to pile them into the car, even to get a bottle of milk. And I would start to entertain them with the songs I sang. Oh, look, there's a lamppost, and look, there's some, something else. And when I sing the songs, they would be quiet and listen, which was very nice because my voice is not the greatest. And when I got home, and they would be playing while I was cooking or washing dishes, I would listen to hear what songs they remembered. And the songs they remembered were the winners. Uh -huh. The one about the turtle crossing the street never made it into my book because they couldn't say the word chaga pacha. Uh -huh. <laughs> they say chaga chaga. And so that would we scratch that one. But the other ones there are Sesame Street like songs uh -huh. and they're up tune. And I sent them to one of the haters, as a matter of fact. Um, and they said, no, this is not for us. The songs are too lively. And I said, ah, well, why is your What do they want, dirges? Okay. But kids love my songs, so even if cool. they don't understand it. So cool. So one of the things that you do besides your uh, employment jobs is you go out and you do lectures for different organizations and different communities. You share uh, history of Yiddish, uh, about the language itself, uh, about um, uh, uh, Jewish wives tales, as they say, Bubba Mises, uh, Yiddish stories. Uh, you tell stories in Yiddish, you're a storyteller. Uh, you speak about famous Yiddish writers such as Shalom Aleichem and Peretz uh, and, and so many others. You, uh, you talk about Yiddish theater. The most famous probably actress, Molly Peacock, um, you know, is something that you look at someone you lecture about, uh, about famous uh, comedians who, who, who spoke Yiddish, such as Jackie Mason, uh, just so many different things. You even talk about George Burns and, and Milton Berle and Woody Allen and, 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 and so on, um, and, and Yiddish music. I just there's so many things. I watch. I'm a singer. You know, you are uh, so worldly in your knowledge about everything. Here, uh, when I knew you years ago, Anita Abraham, uh, Dr. Now you're Dr. Turtletop, and you're this famous Yiddish scholar. Uh, tell me, what, what, what really haven't you done in the world of Yiddish that you're that you're looking towards doing in the future? Because I know this is your passion. Well, there are two things. One thing is those articles that I wrote for the Forbits. Um, they're very, very funny and people really love them, and I'd like to put those in a book, in an illustrated book. Oh, yeah. And so I'd like to find a sponsor for that, uh -huh. uh, and that would be, I think, very, very mm -hmm. fun. And the other thing that someone suggested that I do is become a newscaster. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. I think I'd be better at the weather report in Yiddish. So let's say, um, I just want to, for, for our viewers, let's say today it's going to be uh, 35 degrees outside Fahrenheit and the weather's going to be partly cloudy, partly sunny, and uh, people should dress warm. Can we do that for a little weather report quickly in Yiddish? Heint wird sein 35 Grad in Dresden, ein ganzen Tag. Es wird sein sonnig und a bisschen kiel tut sich und das Wetter ist auch keinen Eustun, wenn ein Windel blast. 
I actually understood part of that. That's great. That's great. I love it. I love it. Tell me, um, you know, when we look at, uh, at things in Yiddish, there are a lot of Yiddish things and a lot of Yiddish movies that became famous over the years, such as the Dybbuk. The Dybbuk is the one that I remember as maybe a teenager or maybe in my 20s when, when I saw it the first time and stuff. Uh, uh, based on something like uh, uh, The Exorcist, almost, uh, in, in a Yiddish, uh, Jewish sort of theme. Kale, azmen losta kala lein parda chipe, kimen beizer iches und pugn ziave. These movies, do you, do you talk about these movies to people? Do you, do you lecture about Jewish and Yiddish movies that have been famous over the years, and Yiddish plays and Yiddish stories that have become uh, famous? Uh, back in the days of Yiddish theater? I talk about pretty much everything related to Judaism. The history of the language, where it's going, who speaks it, movies done in Yiddish, but I must say, now that I have this opportunity, that Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish is very, very popular, wildly popular, popular beyond anybody's wildest dreams, and it's been extended and extended in New York, and now it's extended once more, even though the theater that they're at now has been booked for something else. But the star of that show, Steve Skybell, or Abba Shaya, as I know him, was my student, and I taught him Yiddish. And I am supremely proud of that, as if he were a child of mine, and I see him blossoming. He's just done a wonderful job. So here in Chicago, there are a couple of bands, but probably the most prominent that does a lot of Yiddish music is the Maxwell Street Klezmer Band. Uh, and Lori is, is a good friend, and uh, uh, Lori loves Yiddish music like she loves any music, as much or better than any other music that she, that she does. What do you think about the uh, popularity of Yiddish music? People love to hear it. You know, how many people know Tumbala, Tumbala? Like, you know, I, I, everybody knows that in Jewish, in Jewish uh, 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 circles. What do you think about the, popul the popularity of, of Yiddish music still today, even though people don't speak Yiddish? Well, it's very lively. It's very lively, and uh, people like to dance. And most most weddings, there's a horror. They just dance around in circles because it's always so crowded. And this kind of music lends itself to anything you want to do. It's lively. It sets off the the neshama and just makes you happy whenever you hear it. Not that there aren't love songs in Yiddish and sad songs in Yiddish as well. And Shane uh, de Levona. Is, is very, very popular as a love mm -hmm, song. Mm -hmm. I know that if someone were to sing me a love song, I would like it to be in Yiddish. And my Yiddish mama and Yiddish and in English are both very popular. Both very popular. I, I, I want to go back just for a few moments to Hans Christian Andersen's stories in Yiddish. How do you choose, or who, who approached you and said, uh, let's translate Hans Christian Andersen rather than let's translate, uh, uh, you know, um, some other famous author that we know from the ages? Well, that's a very interesting story. I was at a Yiddish gathering of YIVA, the Yiddish Wissenschaft Institute here in Chicago, and they asked one elderly gentleman to stand up because he had donated quite a bit of money to Yiddish. And he came over to me later and said, we have to talk. I have stuff for you to translate. And I said, yeah, yeah, very nice. Give me your address. And I figured nothing would happen. Well, I came and he said, wait a minute, I have to get this. And he brings out boxes and dust, dust was coming from these boxes. And I'm going, what is this? And he said, these are my father's writings. He was over 80 at the time. And I said, these are, have been in your basement. He says, yeah, I said, how long? He says, 40 years. <laughs> I had a cast mask. And there were stories that he had translated. The man just loved Yiddish, and he had a Danish dictionary, and he was translating stories. When I got those pages that he, this man wanted me to look over, they were brown, the, the edges were crumbling, they were held together by a rusted straight pin, and I could hardly make, make out the words. So I am not the first translator, but I basically had to retranslate the whole thing. And I had to get three different versions in English because I had to find out, what was he saying? Was it a beech tree or a birch tree? And I had to compare the three versions. If two of them agreed it was a beech tree, then it was a beech tree. So, and I, I took out a lot of the um, 
because Hans Christian Andersen was a devout Christian. I took out a lot of the Christian uh, references. references, and I made, I, of course, it's not a Jewish book, but I made it so that it was acceptable to Jewish children. Uh -huh. And I worked really for at least 10 years on those wow. translations. Wow, wow, wow. So what made you want to uh, write, because we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, Yiddish songs for children. Um, it, it's so beautiful. The songs are beautiful. Uh, and as you said, the members of the Israel Philharmonic have played these songs, uh, and they're catchy. What made you want to write this instead of a children's storybook, for example? I told you, because I would sing these songs to my children in the car. And you just wanted to take it what your children loved and put it into My children friends. were typical children, you know. And I sang, so I made them up as I, I went along, as I was driving. I didn't write music. I didn't have a musical background. And as I was driving, they would listen. And I kept making up verses and kept making up verses. And when we got home, the ones they remembered were the winners. And these are the stories that I wrote for my children. Because I wrote them for my children and they loved them, I kept singing them to my children and everybody would listen to me. Finally, I made a match, because I'm also a matchmaker, of a very prominent couple in... Uh, and your name's not even Yenta. Okay, go ahead. Yenta no. <laughs> the matchmaker. <laughs> so, um, a prominent couple, uh -huh. and they just didn't know what to do for me. They were so happy, and they're still uh -huh. happily married. Uh -huh. And finally, I asked her, I said, how would you like to sponsor this book? Because a book costs a lot of money. Sure it does. And she said, well, not right now. And I said, well, I tried. Several years later, she said, now I'm ready. And she sponsored this oh, book. Oh, that's and, so nice. And someone came over to her later, and, she said, and they said, you know, this is one of the best things you've ever done for the Jews in, in, in Chicago and in the world. Wow, 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 wow. I, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you, not just as my friend, but as such a prominent member of the community and such an amazing Jewish scholar uh, on my show with me today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I just want to just kind of ask you, what's your next project? My next project is I, I want to put the stories that I've written for the four books. The four books, that book that you right, talked about. Right. So that's right. your next project. Right, called The Matchmaker Also Wants to Get Married. Although I stopped writing about the Michigan as I've been dating, <laughs> and I started writing stories about my life. Every day in my life brings something wonderful, like this, like being on uh, your show. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm, thank you for being on the show. Uh, Dr. Hanna Feigl Turtletow. Uh, uh, as fondly as I know her as Anita for all these years. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Remember, you can check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com. You can also see former shows on the web. If you want to email our, my guest, you can email us at info at tvrabbi.com, and I will forward it to her, and I know she'll get back to you personally, or if you want to email me, you can email me at that address. And hope to see you next time as well on Take with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. Stay tuned. Taped with Rabbi Doug will be right back. I am an American. I am an American. I'm an American. I am an American. I'm an American. I am 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 an American. I am. American. I am an American. I am an American. I am America. I'm an American. I'm an American. I am an American. I am an American. I am an American. I'm an American. I am an American. I am an American. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans, and soon they will be available to everyone. This vaccine means hope. It will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. I want to go back to work and I want to be able to move around. To visit with Michelle's mom, to hug her and see her on her birthday. You know what I'm really looking forward to is going to opening day in Texas Ranger Stadium with a full stadium. We've lost enough people and we've suffered enough damage. In order to get rid of this pandemic, it's important for our fellow citizens 
to get vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated because we want this pandemic to end as soon as possible. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. So roll up your sleeve and do your part. This is our shot. Now it's up to you. Hi, I'm Avi Myers of the Northtown Neighborhood News Magazine. We, you, we can be seen on Channel 19 together with Rabbi Doug. And don't forget to catch Rabbi Doug every Monday at 8.30 p.m. and every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. on Channel 19 in Chicago and many cable systems besides. And finally now, another memorial to a wonderful person, Terry O'Brien, the former president of the Water Reclamation District of Chicago, who, by the way, is the one who um, saved our homes here in Chicago from flooding every time there was a rainstorm. He was an amazing person, a good friend, did a lot for the city of Chicago, and uh, has been on our show also a number of times. Uh, first introduced to me by the late Avi Myers of Blessed Memory, um, who was also a good friend of his, and Terry and I became close friends. And uh, I want to just play some uh, clips from when he was on our show as well. And uh, we remember Terry O'Brien of Blessed Memory. So stay with us here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. I'm here with President of the Water Reclamation District, Terry O'Brien. How are you, Terry? Good. Great. An old friend and uh, acquaintance, and Terry, uh, you are running for the president of the Cook County Board, and you obviously have a lot of experience running a major government, major government organization. What do you think you can do for the Cook County Board that the others who are all qualified politicians, what can you do that they can't? Well, I think they need to be uh, bring a business sense approach to county government, uh, and that's what we've done at the Water Reclamation District. As I was saying during the forum today, we hire people from what they know and not who they know. And we've got a tremendous record from the standpoint of being fiscally responsible and spending the taxpayers' dollars. There is no accountability. That's all we've heard since we've traveled this county, since we started campaigning. There is no accountability, you know, and they're trying to tax their way out of problems. I can balance the budget any day, just raise the taxes. And that's, that's what he's talking about. He's balancing his budget by raising taxes. Businesses can't do it. You know, businesses, have to, they have to make cuts. And they have to cut in personnel, and they have to cut in the bottom line, and their expenditures. And Businesses are crying in this community because Cook County is not business friendly to them. And we're losing jobs and we're losing companies because of that. And you think that you can change that? Yes. I just received the endorsement from the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce who said, you really get it, you understand what it means to be in business. Because I am a small business owner myself. I know what it means to be in a budget and payroll. I can't go to a taxpayer if I'm short of money. I've got to cut my uh, bottom line and do and do things that are not always pleasant. So. Very, very good. But, well, I wish you much success. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And stay with us here on Tape with Rabbi Doug. Leader of this agency, in 1988, we had 3,000 employees. We are down to 2,056 employees. A 30% reduction in our workforce while taking on an added responsibility, which was that of the county board and that was stormwater management. They had that responsibility going back to 1991. We have taken it over in 2004. We have not had to add anybody onto our workforce, and we don't charge people to wear jeans to our operations. Well, that's it for this week's show in memory of Dr. Anita Turtletaub of Blessed Memory, Hanna Feigl Turtletaub, and in memory of Terry O'Brien of Blessed Memory, we hope to see you next week. Remember, if you want to email us, info at tvrabbi.com is the email address. Check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com, where you can see our guests on the show on past episodes. And hope to see you next time right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. Gonna see Rabbi Doug on the TV tonight. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.